Hello, this one's called the Science Park. The slightly built sandy man showed the effects of sunshine. One might have thought from a sun lounger by some exotic sea, but Professor Johnson was recently arrived home from a working expedition far from any coast. While he had been in Africa, the diaspora of the university science establishment had left their scattered post-war prefabricated semi-permanence and relocated as a single department in a purpose-built science park. I came in when they first opened. It, it was easy to blend in then. The massive contrast, open-skied barren rift valley to paved planted car parks might have caused culture shock if he'd noticed. But there'd been no time spare to notice anything so unessential. For a week, he'd been unpacking the old office and laboratory and reinstalling it in the new building. Now... Having dealt with the recent past, he was preparing to consider the finds he had carefully extracted from the dry African earth and return to the ancient past. I was unemployed and at a loose end. Schumer, his 50-year-old head boy, had spotted the first fragment Sometimes they'd walk for days and see nothing, but when there was something to be seen, nine times out of ten, Schumer would be the one to spot it. This time it was under a dry thorn bush just outside camp. The other men had been passing it daily to fetch water. Schumer, because of his age and elevated position, had avoided this task for three days. Then, on the first occasion he'd ventured forth in that direction, he returned triumphant with the thumbnail-sized fragment of fossilised humanoid bone. Then they had laboured under the remorseless African sun with tender care and attention, excavating until a hole roughly the size of his new laboratory had replaced the dry thorn bush. Everything that came out of the hole, they sieved, watching keenly for fragments of bone, senses sharpened by the small bonus Johnson paid for each one. Over the long weeks he spent with these men, he came to look on them as friends. He knew the wage they were paid was good by local standards, but he also knew he depended on them, and it reconciled him with his sense of fairness to pay the bonus from his own pocket. The workers were carefully picked by Schumer. Johnson would not have had the heart to refuse a man work. The quiet optimism of his Quaker boarding school and the religious society of friends' ability to find worth in others had infused him deeply. He believed that progress and knowledge resulted from man's social nature, that he is good given the opportunity. Things like the recent discovery by one of his colleagues of grave goods in a Neanderthal burial excited him immensely. He felt proof of social wellness in a species separated from us so early on, pointed towards it being something basic in our nature. You wouldn't believe how lonely life can be sometimes. 
On the one hand, he was restricted in his worldview, as one might expect of an academic who specialised in a small group of pre-humans living some millions of years ago. On the other hand, he travelled and lectured all over the world and lived with African labourers on site for months at a time. His faith in the basic ability of his fellow man showed itself in his willingness to explain, from first principles if need be, which gained the mutual respect of academics and labourers. Living in a world that had given him privilege and superiority, he wanted equality and saw sharing his knowledge as a privilege. His only intolerance was with idleness. The slow and the bright student received proportionate attention, but the lazy or inattentive were dismissed with disdain, no matter how bright. To a student's excuse of not having had time to finish a project, he was once heard to reply, Why? What were you doing between two and three this morning, then? Africa was a week away. The move had taken place during his absence in Africa, and everything had been labelled and boxed according to meticulous instructions. The care taken in packing reflected the enthusiasm he exuded. It seemed as natural to his staff as it did to him, something merited by these precious objects. Now the unpacking had been done and the new lab and office felt like his own space. And he was prepared for work. The boxes that had followed him from Africa had progressed to the table, ready to open. Civilised people w with predictable reactions. He was adjusting to the change of mindset needed for the next stage of investigation by making a cup of coffee exactly as he liked it. He carefully washed and rinsed all the utensils, removing the last traces of washing up liquid from them. It seemed scandalous to him that something carcinogenic could be sold for use with eating utensils without warning the purchaser. And then he dried up and recalled the confrontation with his daughter's food tech teacher. She would asserted that it was more hygienic to allow things to air dry. It seemed the woman did not possess the concept of a self-sterilising surface that nothing could live on a polished surface in the absence of water and was unaware that many pathogens are airborne. He'd explained the benefits cheap glazed ware had brought and pointed out that when the unhygienic barmaid polished the glasses with her much-used tea towel, the customers did not all die. The only response had been a cheap glaze of bored indifference on her plate-like face. And his daughter had barred him from speaking to her teachers. He'd studied communications techniques. His interests were eclectic and they were useful in teaching. But sometimes when the foolish and ignorant had fixed ideas. His response to the confrontation was typically mild, to take the responsibility on himself, do the washing up, make sure things got rinsed. If others did the washing up, he'd rinse it out, especially cups. 
the small brown circle left in the upturned base after they had dried always reminded him of the thin layer that must cover the whole cup. He was frowning slightly, thinking of such things as he measured the coffee into the percolator, when there came a tap on the door and the jolly curly-topped head of Davis, a biology with the medical research team, popped through the portal. Hello. Hope we're not interrupting anything too important. How are you settling in? Our new proximity means we're supposed to cooperate to our master's advantage and the advancement of knowledge. Somewhere warm to sit in comfort without being hoovered over. Sorry, hovered over. Perfect timing. I was just measuring the coffee, Johnson replied. A short, round figure appeared behind Davis and was introduced as Young Smith from Physics. The three sat, drank coffee and chit-chatted about the recent trip, the vagaries of travel outside the civilised confines of Europe, the problems of inculcating people with the principles of basic hygiene, the way a minor inconvenience could escalate into a medical emergency. It's great people have time for each other. I made up a bucket of boiled water into a saline solution and the boy sat in the shade and dripped it onto the old man's ulcer for 12 hours at a stretch. Yes, said Smith. You were paying him, and that's easy work. Life's more than economics. You're cynical, replied Johnson. <laughs> what physicist isn't? It goes with the territory, the brash young Welsh biologist interjected. How did you do this time? Anyway, Johnson explained that he had huge amounts of work to do before he'd know. The passing millennia melt meant that the thumbnail-sized fragment initially discovered was not an unusual-sized piece of bone. Further, a skeleton would not be anything like complete, so the next step was something like doing the most complicated jigsaw imaginable with a lot of the bits missing and a rough sketch of the picture. The early stages were easy, though. As we put the spoil through the riddle, we get bone fragments of all sorts. It's usually quite a chore separating the antelope and rhinoceros from the anthropoid. But this time, it was distinctive. He went to the box on the table opened it and fished out a small parcel. Carefully unwrapping it, he handed a small black fragment to Davis. Any idea what would cause that, he asked, pointing out the grey deposit on the surface. To my my, to my eye, it looks like it happened in life. It's only on the outside of the bone. Davis looked at the piece carefully. Yes. Very distinctive. You get something similar when muscle tears away from bone. Weren't civilised enough for rugby, were they? <laughs> he grinned as Johnson shuddered slightly, then said, I wouldn't commit myself until I've done some checking and had a closer look. Mind if I take this with me? Reaching into his pocket, he pulled out a small specimen jar and dropped a piece of bone into it. Then, looking up, caught the face of his distinguished colleague. Don't worry, old chap. I know you've wrapped it in cotton wool all the way from Africa, but if it survived the trip and a few million years in the ground, it should make it across to the med lab, OK? I'll meet you this evening in the common room 
and let you have it back. About six. Not leaving time for Johnson to acquiesce or protest, he made his excuses and left, saying, Excellent coffee, by the way. Thank you. As he went out the door, Smith looked sympathetic. Biologists for you. They spend so much time in the field dealing with the real world. I spend a fair bit of time in the field myself, Johnson replied, slightly piqued. Yes, but your targets have stopped moving. Makes life a bit simpler. Wish mine would stop still for a minute but it's not in the nature of the physical world. What's your line of research? asked Johnson politely, remembering himself. Light, photons, tricksy little devils. One minute they look like particles blend, bending as they come past the sun and such. Next they're more like radio waves with different wavelengths showing different colours. So which are they? asked Johnson. Well, neither, of course. Neither explanation accounts for all the facts, and they can't be both. It's just that those models fit them in particular circumstances. There must be some other overall explanation. I'm trying to build a mathematical theoretical model. Our five senses have provided us with the theories to describe the macro world. But when you get below a certain size, they just don't apply anymore. Trouble is, that leaves me searching in the dark, so to speak. It's a bit like having a very small butterfly net in a darkened barn trying to catch the moths. I think it may be flying silent. I think maybe flying silently about. Oh dear. And have you ever caught any, so to speak? Johnson replied, sounding genuinely concerned at the severity of the other's quest. Sorry, said Smith, catching the slight irony of the repeated, so to speak. It's almost impossible to explain something while deliberately avoiding the analogy of the ordinary senses, and oversimplistic if you don't. However, the question of whether I caught any is pertinent. You see, confidentially, I'm pretty sure I have. But where I, when I do, there is always something missing. Mathematically, you can't have that. The books have got to balance. Matter and energy can be neither created nor destroyed, you know. I'm familiar with the concept. I think it's fairly basic, scientific one, Johnson answered, touched dryly. Then, relenting again, as was his nature, when I was a little boy, shadows used to worry me. They seemed so real, I couldn't grasp the concept of them being a mere absence, and wondered where they went when the sun went in. They both smiled, and then in the moment of slight awkwardness that followed, Smith made his excuses, saying he would also be in the common room that evening to satisfy his curiosity regarding the strange growth on the bone. An affordable cup of tea, and someone interesting to talk to. Johnson had not been in the new common room before. Partly, he was not a naturally gregarious man. He loved mankind communally and intellectually, but individually and socially he found his fellow man wearing. But further, his workload had simply not allowed it. He was impressed. There was a small bar with a young lady serving quite acceptable hot drinks and selling occasional bottles of beer, 
from a fridge where she also kept the milk. Soya semi-skimmed or normal, sir. He was even more impressed. Then there were the seats. He realised that he had become used to the modern concept of seating, designed to maximise customer through flow. These were actually comfortable to sit in, and he had the impression that they might outlast some of their older inhabitants rather than rapidly turning into useless pieces of junk. After inspecting the very acceptable reproductions on the walls with approval, he'd barely settled himself with his tea when Davis and another colleague from the biology department joined him. Clutching a bottle of beer, Davis dropped heavily into the seat opposite and back past the specimen jar containing the bone sample across to him. Johnson caught it awkwardly and was anxiously checking the contents to see if the rough handling by the alcohol imbiber had caused any damage, when Smith also joined them. Stowing the precious jar away, Johnson looked up as Smith sat down. Quite a decent cup of tea here, he said, pointedly looking at Davis's beer. Not bad, said Smith, then noticing the direction of Johnson's look. Lucky devil, lives within walking distance. I have to wait till I get home before I can have a beer. Still, it's a nice walk to the pub after dinner. Johnson sighed inwardly. Like the educators of his youth, he was not a proselytiser but relied on the effect of example to spread his creed. It was depressing that people, even among those trained to observe, could be so unobservant. How are you getting on with your moths in the barn? He asked Smith by way of politeness. Moths in a barn? echoed the stranger with Davis. Are you a biologist as well? No, no, a, f a physicist. It was an analogy. I said something was like trying to catch moths in a darkened barn with a butterfly net. The biologist smiled. They shriek, you know. Moths. They give out ultrasonic signal. That's how bats and little owls find them. It's not just the famous echo sounder effect. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Professor, said Smith, looking suddenly thoughtful. I'm sorry, interposed Davis. Have you not met at all? This, this is Professor Hargreaves. I showed him your samples. Johnson, more than his line than mine. There was a general shaking of hands and all-round introductions, and then Johnson asked, Did you come to any conclusions? By then, I was a regular. Everyone simply accepted me. Well, yes, quite a surprising one, really. Of course... We're dealing with an extinct species of which we know next to nothing in metabolic terms, but unless it's caused by some viral infection previously unobserved or some such unlikely event, I think I could say with some degree of certainty it's down to vitamin A poisoning. I love the way my fellow scientists get cautious when they're around one another, said Davis. Earlier, he was pretty damned unequivocal about what caused it. He's right to be cautious, said Johnson. I once found an early human encampment littered with gazelle bones. I could have come to the conclusion that they hunted gazelle 
when the same site might have been used by a leopard 50 or 100 years later. One must account for all possibilities and then look for further evidence. Very true, replied Hargreaves, except in this case the damage exactly replicates what one would expect from vitamin A poisoning and there's never been any other cause demonstrated for such damage. Really, I think it's pretty conclusive. He must have found a bloody big field of carrots, said Smith, smiling. <laughs> I think it was probably a young female, actually. There was quite a size difference between the sexes, said the forever literal Johnson. The usual cause of vitamin A poisoning outside of a few over-eager health fanatic pill poppers is eating the livers of carnivores, Hargreaves contributed. Mammals do not possess process vitamin A through the urine and any excess is stored in the liver. Indigenous people such as the Inuit who eat carnivores know this and avoid the liver. But there was a terrible case of Antar Antarctic explorers who were unaware. They ate their dogs to avoid starvation. Ironically, the one who was sickest was given the liver as the choicest morsel because he was sick. The excess vitamin A breaks down a layer covering the bone that the muscle attaches to. When the muscle is used, it tears away from the bone and has nothing to lever against anymore. Absolutely agonising and it leaves the victim helpless. After a while, you start to believe your own story. There was a moment's silence as they considered the implications of this. For a young female anthropoid on the Pleistocian plain. Very nasty, said Johnson, but I don't see why you think it so surprising. All the indications we have point towards them having been scavengers. The normal modus operandi for scavengers is to drive a carnivore off their kill Although there are only a few carnivores compared to herbivores, a dead one would likely be quite old and tough. The liver would be a natural part to go for. I suppose they might manage to kill a carnivore occasionally while driving it off, said Smith. That would be unusual, said Davis. Most animals know their limits and only stop to fight if they think they can win. That would explain why they don't know, in, know to avoid carnivore liver. A random chance occurrence, responded Smith. I think there's something I've not explained adequately, said Hargreaves. The layer we're looking at is not the direct result of the damage, but rather the body's attempt to repair itself. She must have survived the poisoning for several months for this to have grown. The immediate conclusion that presents itself is that she lived in some sort of group that had sufficient social structure to provide support for its sick. She could never have survived alone. Amazing, said Smith to draw behavioural conclusions from fossilised bones millions of years old. One mustn't jump to conclusions, but I can't think of another explanation, Hargreaves replied. I made myself a good listener. It was interesting, so it was easy. Not unprecedented, Johnson said to Smith.
cut marks on the gazelle bones demonstrated the use of flint tools and denied the leopard theory I put forward earlier, he said. Though this is in a bit of a different league, he added. Outwardly calm, inside he was seething with excitement over the implications. There has always been discussions about the implications of diet on behaviour. Herd animals and pack animals behave quite differently towards other members of their group. The vegetarian herd animals are much more other-oriented. At the top end of the scale, elephants are tremendously protective towards injured or weaker members of the group. On the other hand, in pack animals like dogs, the dominant bitch rules by fear. Her puppies survive and she methodically kills any born to another, another bitch. Any weakling is persecuted mercilessly. It's dog eat dog and the weakest go to the wall, said Davis. But if man was a carnivore at that time, how does that fit in? asked Davis. <laughs> Well, he was probably carnivorous, Johnson replied. He could have been an omnivore. Evidence is scarce. We know they ate meat, though, because bones remain where vegetable matter vanishes. In modern hunter-gatherer societies, the main feeds food source in terms of calories is provided by the women gatherers, though much more emphasis is put on the returns of the hunters. We don't really see him as a hunter at this stage, much more a scavenger, and driving off a carnivore with his prey is a fairly co cooperative affair. So there's room for social development there. There's no way of knowing how much of a park gathering played in their diet. I remember reading Jane Goodall, said Smith. Those Gombe River chimps behave quite differently when they hunted meat. Eating communally, hunching protectively over their food like people in restaurants. Yes, and they hunted it communally. Ideas were starting to fly. Professor Hargreaves chipped in. As a young man, I had some interest in feral children. The jungle book thing is a pure myth. Children raised by wolves are savage and remain savage. If captured, they appear unhappy, fail to learn and die young. On the other hand, there was a case of a young boy who came in an ostrich nest just as the eggs were hatching and went off with them. He was away some years before returning to his family he grew up normally and spoke of the period with affection in later life. They appeared to have had no concept of how long he'd been gone at the time. Then there was a Frenchman who found a boy living wild with gazelles in the Spanish Sahara. It was a teenager and appeared, he appeared to have grown up with them. He was well adjusted to his group and he had a place in the herd structure. During the Age of Reason, the wild boy of Avignon was discovered. He appeared to have subsisted on his own, on berries and nuts for some years before he was found. The general conclusion seems to be that humans fit in well with herd animals, but being with carnivals screws them up totally. There was some further general discussion on the state of man and considerable excitement at the revelation before the group broke up. But strangely, it was Smith, the physicist, who had spent most of the latter part of the evening in deep contemplation who seemed the most enthused as they went their separate ways.
this group met regularly after that, people were seconded into it and sometimes dropped out, but the core group remained and the subject was always man, his motivations, drives and social bondings. Although Smith, the physicist, remained part of the group and was often present, he remained generally in the background, mostly contributing questions to the biologists and social scientists. Johnson, the paleontologist, was a trifle surprised when Smith approached him one day and asked if he might demonstrate something which might be of interest. He'd agreed from common courtesy and continued in his work not thinking of it again until Smith tapped at his door at the agreed hour. Smith shelved his current task and hospitably invited him in. Whilst he was preparing coffee for them, the young man explained that his studies had achieved some considerable advances. It was very largely down to a couple of things that you and a biology professor said, and I really felt you deserved to be among the first to see the results, he said. They sat down together with their coffee and he elaborated. Do you remember when I said there was something missing, and you said that when you were young you wondered what happened to shadows? They seemed so solid, and then later in the evening that other fellow told us that moths emitted ultrasonic signals which guided bats rather than the signals always emanating from the bats. It's funny how these things work, isn't it? It gave me a whole new way of looking at my problem. And once I had a theory, the accompanying technology practically seemed to build itself. Do you have a computer I can plug into? He produced a very homemade looking box of tricks from the back bo backpack he had been carrying. I really must get myself one of these laptops. They're excellent, built in wireless and everything. Mind you, it's another thing to carry about, isn't it? Johnson watched with a layer of polite expectancy as he plugged the various parts together. Then Smith stood back and said, Do you think I could borrow a fragment of bone from you? From your young lady, who had the excess of vitamin A, wasn't it? Johnson expressed some surprise. I, w I won't damage it, you see. I've discovered that the photon entering and leaving the atom leaves a negative trace, a shadow, so to speak, but one with a positive value. By letting it guide me, rather than trying to trace it with energy signals that swamp it out, I am able to follow it through nearby atoms in time and space and build a picture, he continued. He carefully placed the sample Johnson gave him in a small aperture in his machine and pressed a power button. The bone is an excellent medium because we know that the layer on the surface must have been laid down shortly before her death and that there was a period when it would have been mostly in the dark. I did my experiments with chalk and spent a lot of time looking at sediment and blank underwater seascapes, moving the image spatially as well as temporarily by jumping them from atom to atom was the first improvement. And then I devised a way of jumping to the virtual atoms that existed next to the original ones in the past. Ah, here we are. The computer screen had cleared and showed what appeared to be a small patch of dry earth. Then, as Smith manipulated the controls, backed off to a wider picture of what Johnson instantly recognised as Africa, with a small group of anthropoids in view. 
He gasped briefly in astonishment. I've gone back a bit temporarily, said Smith. The rest of the afternoon seemed to fly by. They lost the picture a couple of times and Smith had to work on his machine briefly at one point while Johnson tried hard not to breathe down his neck with impatience. But by early evening they had the whole story. They'd seen the encounter with the group of young males. These had killed a dog-like animal that tried to defend its kill from them and now they had two carcasses. Backtracking the group in time, they'd seen the lucky shot from a thrown stone, a novel to technique. It had caught the dog unaware. The family group was not strong enough to remove either kill and moved on. But one of the young females had stayed behind on the fringes of the group of young males. She was too cautious to come near them, but they'd seen one of the males remove something from the dog secretively and carry it to the other carcass, then pretend to remove it, carry it to a large stone and leave it for her so that she could eat unmolested. After she'd rejoined her family group, the young males had followed it until she dropped out, unable to carry on. They watched in horror the abduction and repeated rapes, alternating with apparent tenderness as they fed her and maintained her as their sex slave. Remarkable. Absolutely remarkable, said Johnson. I can't wait to show my colleagues... Oh no, said Smith, looking dismayed. Um, I've had no doubt that someone else will come up with the principle independently eventually, but I really couldn't take the responsibility of releasing such a thing on the world. There's no reason why it shouldn't be used on the most more recent past. It would destroy privacy. You saw what mankind is descended from? They discussed it for some time before Smith left, but he was adamant. And when Johnson went looking for him next day in the physics department, it was though he'd vanished off the face of the earth, or never existed. Redundant males are not unlike professors to the casual observer. It was two weeks before Johnson managed to trace him and another week of research before he knocked on his door and greeted him by a name that was not Smith and was reluctantly invited in. When Davis struck up a conversation, he introduced himself as a biologist. So I picked physics as the subject he was least likely to be knowledgeable in or want to talk about. It worked beautifully. He's a nice chap. Company was like a gift of manner. After a while, you start to believe the part for yourself. Then you made the reference about the leopard. Something about the way you put it struck me. It made me want to demonstrate alternatives to your snug story and goody-goody people. But I was a physics professor, not any part of the natural sciences. I had to find a way of demonstrating it as, as I, what I was. A part of me never believed that you'd swallow it. Professor Smith and his time machine. Partly the desire to believe, and the fact that I thought you were part of our community but also the work and knowledge you put into it and your destruction of that gossamer web of fantasy that we were constructing more than justified it. I fully deserve to be brought down a peg or two 
That's the remit of novelists, not scientists. It wasn't that hard. The CD player came from the charity shop and I used Photoshop on the library's computer. There wasn't much more to it. Not the technology, the concept, the accuracy, the research and original ideas, like the fur and making her beautiful. We're so used to the convention that primitive means ugly. He drew breath briefly. Now, I had a word with Professor Jones in psychology. His speciality is criminality, and he found your story interesting enough that we could get you in there. But really, I think you'd be better off in the philosophy department. You will join us, won't you? Truly intelligent people, as scarcer than we would wish, I could ask about. I'm sure we could find you some part-time work. I'm sorry, I'm rushing you. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. It's quite a long story. It worked very well for a long story. Um, if you enjoyed, please share my site with your friends, won't you? It's the best advertising I could possibly possibly get. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye.